Founders face mentors and masters. I'm Captain Hawk, CEO of Founders Space, the leading global startup accelerator. I'm also author of the award-winning books, Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Horses. I'm here today with Marty Nemco. And this is a real treat for me because I have spent years listening to Marty's radio show, work with Marty Nemco on NPR, and this is the first time I get to interview him. So Marty, welcome to the show. My pleasure. Now Marty's doing a lot of stuff. He's now podcasting like the rest of us. He has a new podcast, which he'll tell you about. And Marty, I'd like to begin with a little about your background, because I know you've had an amazing background. You've interviewed some incredible people. I mean, the list is too long to read them all here, but tell the audience a little about yourself. Most people don't want to know a lot. In the essences that may be relevant to the entrepreneur in the audience, child of Holocaust survivors, and that has informed a lot of my beliefs about what works and what doesn't. Uh, I have a PhD from Berkeley in evaluation of innovation, which I have often thought about renouncing because it has not provided much value added. What has provided more value added is my 6,000 career counseling clients. So today we are going to go deep on radical honesty. What does radical honesty mean? And how do you use radical honesty in the workplace and in your life? So Marty, what does radical honesty mean to you? It means a complete 180 from the way in which most of us think in the workplace, especially if you're a startup, you're trying to make your number, you're trying to make keep from going out of business, you're trying to grow, you're trying to pitch your venture capitalists to invest in you. And ultimately, cosmically wise, both for your business, and yourself, and your family, and society, it is very wise to be radically honest. So I've seen a lot of places where entrepreneurs fudge. So one of the big ones is when they're in a boardroom. So they have this board of directors. Some of them are the venture capitalists who invested in their company. Some are outside board members. Now these board of directors hold the entrepreneur's fate in their hand. They can literally, a lot of times, if they have the votes, fire the entrepreneur. Right. So the entrepreneurs are under pressure and they often paint a rosy picture. They sugarcoat everything. Right. Now, why is this a bad idea? Well, because let's say you win in the short term and you get the series C and now you're, you're creating false expectations. If your product sucks and you know that technology isn't as good as you thought it was going to be, for you to BS it and say, oh yes, we're making great progress on this laser photography, whatever, and then it doesn't work. First of all, you will screw your reputation you will just keep your employees who are already struggling to, they're, they're smiling at the meeting and say, yeah, man, we're doing great. When it's BS, ultimately, as corny as it sounds, the truth shall set you free. And they will trust you more. Your VCs will trust you more, if not on this project, on the next. If you outline, I'm not saying you may say, but you say the real truth, the upsides and downsides and say, guys, if you think, and women, of course, if you guys think that this is not a good investment, I will honor that. And, uh, you know, but one thing you're going to get from me is radical honesty. They'll love you. That is so refreshing compared to the usual BS. I completely agree because I found this. You can actually dig your own grave by fudging the truth. For example, you know, you have this board of directors there. They want progress reports. They want, they want you to forecast like your future sales. If you start to inflate those numbers, eventually it's going to catch up with you, especially if there's a fundamental problem with what's going on. Now, I've found that a far better way is to actually, when you're being radically honest, when you tell them, look, we're having this problem, like th there's, the, you know, we're having this key development problem. We're not, we're not going to get the product out on time, or it's not going to function as the customers expect. And then you turn to them, instead of def being defensive, you turn to them and you say, how do I solve this? Like, we're all in this together. What are your ideas? Like, tell me what, how you can help me solve this problem. That gets the board members on your side instead of you putting up this facade and that will eventually fall away and expose the real truth. Very often the board doesn't have the technical expertise. If your technology is not working that well, you need to say, you know, 
Right now, we're having a lot of problem with the resolution on these videos. And my plan is, I can't guarantee it's going to work, but I've identified two really brilliant consultants I'm planning to bring in short term at minimal cost to see if we can solve. I'll then give you an update. Coming to them with the honest problem, but your proposed solution, or really, let's just say it's not La La Land and you know it ain't going to work. You see that the technology is limiting. It's just not going to happen. It's going to, it's going to take many millions of dollars or it's even bumping up against physics to limitations. So, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I know this is not something you normally hear, but I'm feeling like I'm going to be wasting your money if we get another series here. Unless you can come up with a better solution. I think this would be wise for me to shut this one down. And later when I have something I feel more optimistic about, I'll come to you. That's cosmically right. Does that make sense? It makes complete sense. And I've actually been there and done that. So given money back to venture capitalists, which is very rare, most people just one more Hail Mary will make it work. And at a certain point, you know when it's not working. Now, when you're doing radical honesty, uh, there is a line to cross. And often the line is very fuzzy at the beginning. You know, all entrepreneurs exaggerate, they hype things up. And then we get to the point. But once you cross that line, it's hard to go back. Now, we've seen this with the company Theranos and Elizabeth Holmes. Right now, she's on trial for literally being radically dishonest. Yes, I don't think she was close. You know, I read that book. She, I think, knew that she, it wasn't gray area. Gray area is easy to deal with. You know how you deal with gray area? Probabilistic. Ladies and gentlemen, I think the probability of this technology working well enough within budget is about 70%, but I can't swear. That's great. No problem there. But she did BS uh, testing that they knew up front that this black box was garbage. That's just complete dishonesty. If, if it's true, according to this book, bad blood. Yeah. And the more she covered it up, the harder it was to get out. She Absolutely. could not, at a certain point, you can't go back and tell them, oh, for the past six months, I've been totally lying to you. <laughs> this Absolutely. doesn't work at all right. once you've been telling them it works. So it's a really bad path to go down. Now with your employees, how is it best to be radically honest with them? Because I know sometimes being too honest can actually offend people. Let's take an example. How would it offend them? So, you know, certain people are very sensitive. So if you come and you say, whoa, what you're doing is crap. Like it doesn't work. They may feel that you could have said it in a much more of course, Steve, empathetic way. Radical honesty doesn't require rudeness. So let's say you're doing crap work. It would be just inhumane. And to say, Steve, you, you got a minute? I'd like to buy you a cup of coffee. I say, you know, I really like these things about what you're doing, but... I'm very concerned about X, Y, and Z. Am I missing something, right? That is giving him some agency. It is totally respectful, but it is totally F honest because I use that word all the time. It's critical to be tactful sometimes, 90% of the time. There's no black and white in the real world. There's a certain amount of time when somebody is too complacent and they've got too big a self. They're big and bad and they're high and mighty and they're loud and proud and they think they're fabulous, but really, and they are, have a wall of defensiveness. Sometimes you've got to be less tactful, but for 95% of the time, it's wise to be radically honest, but with tact and propose a solution. Hey, is there any way I can be helpful here? What do you think you can do about this? Am I missing something? That way you can be radically honest and constructive. I agree, honestly, because I've dealt with a lot of employees. And when you try to dance around an issue, uh, it comes across as being fake, comes across as passive aggressive. It's better to just come out with it tell them what the problem is, dive into it together. Like you said, key is not uh, pointing out blame. You know, being radically honest doesn't mean blaming people. It means just laying the facts on the table and then working together to problem solve. It can be blaming if the responsibility lies in that person. You can blame, say, you know what? I don't think your contribution here is adequate for these reasons, but it doesn't mean you need to be mean about it. There's another reason for radical honesty we haven't talked about. It is the coworkers. Deep down, those coworkers know that there is, let's say, one person who's not pulling his or her weight. And if you're just pussyfooting around and saying all these nicey, nicey things, that's dispiriting to them. It hurts their job security if you're in a startup situation, because it makes it more likely to, for the business to go out of business. So they benefit from your tactful, radical honesty. That makes sense. Now, when you're in a meeting, let's say a meeting with a team, a team meeting, you know, some personalities dominate them. I won't let that. No, I won't say that you're making it sound like a fait complete. If somebody is indeed dominating the meeting, I will interrupt them 
and I will say, I think I've got the essence of your point. I want to make sure that Mary and Joe and John get a chance to say, Mary, what do you think? What do you think about radical honesty in the meeting context in calling other people out on things they're saying? I'm playing devil's advocate here. Great. So you could, in the meeting, call somebody else out, make them very uncomfortable because they're a shy, maybe introverted type person and you're interrupting them and saying, no, you're totally wrong, being honest, but uh, they may not uh, feel comfortable speaking again in the next meeting. Well, so let's say somebody is shy and they finally make a comment and it's stupid. I'm not going to let the tail wag the dog, but I'm also not going to be rude. If I feel that my correcting them or something is going to improve the quality of the product, if it serves a larger good, I will give the feedback, but very ta especially tactfully in a meeting. If I feel it's not that critical, I won't say a thing. I'll just say, okay, Mary, what do you think? And then after the meeting, I might talk privately with that person, again, with tactful radical honesty. I'm always weighing all the stakeholders from the person to the coworkers to the customer to the vendors to society and say, is it wise for me now to hit them between the eyes, tactful feedback in the meeting, tactful feedback out of the meeting, or what? I have another situation that I can imagine. Let's say there's certain information that was discussed privately at a board meeting or between you and somebody else, or even if they didn't explicitly say it was private, it was implied privacy. Now, that information, though, it's in, people ask you about it and they say, well, what about this situation? Now, you know the answer because you've discussed it either with the board or other managers. What do you do? Do you be totally honest in that situation? How do you handle it? Well, there are a couple of options. Number one is asking the person permission. You know, this is pretty critical. Would you mind if I mention it? Would you mind if I mention it without attribution to you? Would you mind I mention it with attribution to you? There's rarely a time where you have to go behind their back. So have that, con that respectful conversation. Giving choices is also empowering to the person. I have to share this. Would you want me to share it with attribution or without? Or, you know, is there an argument for my not sharing it at all? You're having a brief, I'm not saying long meetings. I'm the last guy who wants long meetings, but a crisp giving of choices can get to the issue, get to the resolution, the prompt, ethical, but honest resolution quickly. Yeah, so I've been in situations where the board of directors is like, you know, we're running out of money. So we may have to lay off some people, we may have to make big changes, but we don't wanna let this out earlier than we are prepared to make the decision. Yet some companies, and they're out there, want to be completely transparent, completely radically honest, like about everything. Now, where do you draw the line? Okay, let's say you were my, my supervisee and you came to me and you said, you know, our bonuses were really small. I'm hearing little noise. We're not really getting our product out to the market. We only have two customers. You know, are, are we going to stay alive? Are we going to run out of money? Or are, are we bleeding cash? We're going to be out of business. And my answer would be, because I'm not sure, but that's, I say, you have reason to be concerned. But I'm, as you know, you've known me, I'm a straight shooter. We're trying this, 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 and this. And we are trying like hell to stay afloat. Can I guarantee you? We're not going out of business in a month. We're not going out of business in two months. We may never go out of business. But I can't say there's zero probability that we're not going to go out of business in a year. I'm doing everything I damn can. And we, I know we all are. So that's how I can be radically honest and still not make everybody, you know, abandon ship and run to the next next shiny object. Yeah. So it's really tough because it, it, in fact, it may only be you have two months left. And if you don't get another round of funding in two months, you're sunk. Yet you don't know. Then. I would, then I would say, I just, Merton says saying a year, you know what? I think we've got a two, two, uh, two month runway. I'm hoping we can make it work. I certainly can't guarantee, but you know, I'm a straight shooter. If we were definitely out of here, I would tell you so right now. So I want you to have time to find something else. We're not definitely out of here, but there's a chance we're going to be out of here. But I'm working my ass off and I'm asking you guys, I'm working on getting that series B, you know, whatever. So I can be radically honest, even with a two month runway. Now, there's some companies out there that are experimenting with extreme radical honesty or total transparency, where they're letting their employees know everything, like literally all the discussions in the board meeting, all, you know, every employee's salary, everything that's going on with the, the numbers. What do you think of that? Depending upon the people, depending upon the organization, depending upon the dirty, dark secrets, you're going to either be radically, completely honest, be a little bit more hedgy, but not dishonest at all. Or I don't ever def defend the, com the complete withholding crap. 
you know, withholding all the information. But the level of extreme honesty can vary a bit depending upon the people involved. If I know that somebody is really going to be, he has zero loyalty, he could get hired in a minute, he's absolutely critical to this job for the next two months. I may not say, hey, you know, the chance of 90% we're going out of business. I still wouldn't lie. I would say, we're trying like hell. There's a, good, there's a chance we're going to be able to survive. I will promise to let you know when we get some clarity. So, you know, that's, a, that's as best as I can do. Now, do you think on average, it's better to uh, move towards the honest, transparent side of doing business or the more secretive side? And let me say, Go ahead. there are different companies out there. Like you look at Apple. They're super secretive. Like everything at Apple is like kept in a silo. Even people within the company can't don't know often what's going on in all the other divisions. And then you look at companies like Google, which are much more open and much more sharing of information. Both models seem to produce results. It's not just about results. It's about process. I would err on the side of more transparency. Pure transparency, nothing is black and white, but I certainly err in general toward more transparency because Again, when you consider all the stakeholders, the workers will feel better about their job. We're not creating undue anxiety, but we're not BSing either. Everybody knows where they stand. And by the way, with, all, with so much of the information out there, I can get the collective wisdom of my employees to offer suggestions for improvement. I agree. And when I look at startups out there, the ones where people are really motivated, really invested in what they're doing, on average, they tend to be much more open. What radical honesty does, and honesty in general, is it increases trust. And trust is, for me, it's kind of the glue that binds a team together. It's the thing that makes you feel like you know these people, you can count on them, they have your back. And that's what makes great teams perform. It's easy for me to be high-minded in this lovely office of mine and talking to you in this peaceful environment to say all this stuff. But what's good, the reality, the real reality, I've done, look, I've done this with clients for decades now. You're going to get some pushback. Too candid with a, an employee. They're going to blame you for this, that. I can call you racist or sexist. and They'll, they'll do whatever. To, to win. And so you have to have, and it's corny, but it's true. Your moral compass needs to be strong. You need to, again, realize that your obligation is to the cosmos, as crazy as that sounds. Your obligation is first to the cosmos, what is, what is really right in the cosmic scheme of things, what is right for the society, what is right for your coworkers, what is right for the making a better product, what is right for, the, for that worker, the vendors, the customers, keeping all that in mind will give you the emotional strength to withstand unfair pushback. And I think it permeates the company from the top down. Like if the managers are honest, then, the, then everybody else starts to, it goes right down, everybody else starts to be more honest with each other. You get a much more functional company at the end of the day. I'm not asking people to be mean. Tactful, radical honesty, not mean radical. Exactly. Like you have to be sensitive. Some people have very thin skins. Other people are much more resilient. They can Good take point. a you know, much more direct approach. Let's talk about sales now, radical honesty and sales. You know, we always know salespeople, their job is to get the numbers. Their job. I say, you know what your job is? To find customers who really are better off with our project. And I'd rather see you have worse numbers and, but sell to people who are going to be happy with the product. Give us great word of mouth, great references. Don't push that shit on them. You know, we're not selling lipstick to a pig or forgetting about that extreme example. If your our competitor's product is better for them, you fucking tell them. Absolutely. You know, again, you build trust with the customer by doing that. Like if you have the customer's best interest in mind from in your mindset, going and talking to them, they pick up on that. They understand very quickly that you aren't just trying to sell them something. You're trying to help them solve a problem. And I want to give you an interesting story out there that I know of. There is an entrepreneur out there, and he actually, when he went to his investors, he didn't just show them all the great things. Like most, most entrepreneurs, when they pitch investors, they're showing, oh, this, this is great. This is great. You know, they're selling them. Instead, he showed them all the things that they have working and all the things that they have issues with. The investors loved it. They closed the deal. They gave him money. Then- a few years later, they decided their company had hit a plateau and, they, and it was time for them to sell. So he went to Disney and he did the exact same thing. He showed Disney, well, this is all the good things that we're doing. And here's where we have problems, like our company. The execs at Disney looked at him and they said, nobody who wants us to acquire their company has ever been so honest. 
and they ended up acquiring his company precisely for the reason they felt like they could trust him. They wanted him on their team. They understood the flaws and they understood the benefits of what they were getting. You're radically honest with your, with your viewers. That's a nice story. That's a win-win. But you're going to lose. A lot of times you're going to lose. They're going to hear that honest disclosure and they're not going to give you the money. <laughs> you're not going to make the sale. And that's where the moral company says, I'd rather be radically honest and tell my son or daughter and my spouse or my friends or whatever, even if I'm making less money. Ultimately, when you're on your deathbed, you will feel better about using that approach. And you may win more and you may not, but it's, that's the secondary issue. That's you want true. to do the cosmically right thing. That's true. It's absolutely true because it won't always work out that fairy tale ending like with Disney. Sometimes it works and with other people, you would have been better off keeping your mouth shut about those problems. It depends what the problems are. But at the end of the day, you can sleep at night because you know you weren't being a con man, a trickster, trying to get them to buy something when they didn't really know what it was. Now, in your personal life, in your marriage or in your with your partner, your significant other, how does radical honesty play a role in that? Equally so. So, um, for example, the article I wrote in Psychology Today um, called Radical Honesty gave a, a real world example from one of my clients. I don't know if you know this, my, my clients are quite senior people and we talk heavily about career, but also very often we talk about their relationships. And one of my clients told me, he says, you know, I feel like my wife is really cold to me. You know, when I come home, she says hello to the dog first before she says hello to me. And then when I'm trying to tell her about my day at all, she's multitasking. She's checking her phone. She's cleaning the kitchen. She's looking at her email. She's doing, I feel like I don't count at all. And radical honesty, again, we're talking about tactful radical honesty, would be to say, and I coached my client, we role played to, on how, you know, I said, you know, I'll just call her Mary. Mary, um, you know, I, you know, we all multitask, we're all really busy. Um, and I love listening to you about hearing about your day. But I find that quite often when I'm telling about my day, you're so multitasking, I feel like I know you're able to multitask, but I would welcome a little under, undivided attention. Am I being unreasonable? That's tactful, radical honesty. I found that to be so true in relationships. You, you, your relationship can't progress if you aren't saying what you think, if you're keeping it bottled up. It, it's bad for you and it's bad for your partner. And at the end of the day, the, the relationships that I see that really work are where both party, you know, they actually did something where there are relationships where each party is actually uh, poking one another, saying, you know, like, don't do that or do, they're saying exactly what they think. And those relationships seem a little more antagonistic, but actually the marriages mass last much longer because each party is being really honest when the other's annoying them or doing this. I want to provide a little nuance, however. There are times, the, the time to be radically honest is when it can be changed. I had another client tell me, his wife asked him, am I looking heavy? And she's been heavy for a long time and she just has a predisposition to be heavy. And her legs are veiny and she's not attractive. She's in her fifties or whatever and not particularly attractive. And he asked me, what should I say? I kind of said, yeah, you look, for, you look great. I'd say your intuition is basically right. I think if it's not going to be fixable, we all know 98% of people who lose weight gain it all back and more. So to tell her, no, you pig, or even tactfully, yeah, I think you could lose 20 pounds. She knows that in her heart of hearts anyway. She can read the scales. She knows. So in that case, because it's not changeable, that's where the tact needs to outweigh the honesty and say, I love you. I think you're still really attractive. Even if your sex life sucks, saying, you know, I still think you're really attractive. And whether you have a few pounds more, or a few pounds less is, is not relevant. You want to lose more weight? Great. If not, I love you anyway. That subtly hints that you wouldn't mind her losing 20 pounds, but it certainly is emphasizing the tact. Yeah. It's like when somebody comes out, up to you and isn't my baby cute? And maybe the baby isn't cute. You're not going to gain anything by saying, oh, your baby's really butt ugly. I'm sorry. Exactly. Marty, this has been fantastic having you on the show. You've uh, provided a wealth of advice. I would like you to share with the audience about your a little about your podcast and where they can find you. Podcast nobody listens to. Hey, go about radical honesty. I'm disappointed. I mean, it is available on Amazon. It's got a few great reviews, no bad ones. You're getting a sense of what I'm like. This is what I'm like. 
but most people don't listen to it. But it's it's called How to Do Life. You can find it on Amazon or Spotify, on, on Apple or Spotify. Where people get the most benefit from me for free is my articles. I've written, as I said, 4,500 articles in 13 books. The articles are all free. I've written over 2,000 for Psychology Today alone. Just Google Marty Nemco and whatever topic you're interested in related to work or relationships or money or the meaning of life, you'll, you'll find it. I, my practice is quite full, but what I do is invite people to email me description of your situation and what you're hoping to accomplish. And I'll either offer you free advice or if I feel it's worth your spending time with me and money, I will let you know and offer you appointments or I'll refer you to an appropriate person. So you'll get your radical honesty from me no matter what. And my email address is M Nemco. That's the first initial of my first name, M and my last name, Nemco, M and then N-E-M-K-O at Comcast.net. Marty, thank you for being radically honest with us. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you liked it, hit the subscribe button and share it with your friends. You can help us create more great content by subscribing and sharing. Also, if you want to access our online startup program, our investor network, and our entrepreneur resources, just come to founderspace.com.